My topic is called Feely and Keely didn't just come out of nowhere. Some medieval sources of Tolkien's Hobbit. And um, I want to start out with a little anecdote. And that was uh, back in 1980. Um, I was at I was a, a senior at Houghton College, and I was taking a writer's workshop for my writing minor. One of my classmates um, was creating an elaborate fantasy novel. Um, it was a story with its own geography and history and names and so forth. Um, but when people in the workshop started making the inevitable connections to Tolkien, she rocked. Um, she deliberately, she said that she deliberately refused to read J.R.R. Tolkien or C.S. Lewis or any other fantasy writers because she was afraid and convinced, um, she was convinced that the only way she could legitimately create fantasy would be to avoid anything uh, that might be shown to influence her. Uh, she was just terrified of this. Um, now, this wasn't, again, this was not an arrogant position. She was afraid that she'd be accused of being an imitator and not a true creator. Um, now, this notion of not looking at or not knowing about sources would have seemed very odd to Tolkien himself, um, as it would be to any medievalist. Um, this is something that medievalists do all the time. I am a card-carrying medievalist, and that's what um, I, that's one of my positions here in the department, along with other hats that I wear. Um, medievalists look for sources and how these, these were changed and adapted by later writers. The intertextuality if you like, of um, early sources and later sources, and how those changes suggest something about later social concerns, uh, their reception and rereading of the past, um, and the extent to which the, uh, the individual talent, to use a post-romantic term and kind of an Eliot term, can be partly characterized in terms of reshaping sources. Um, so that's something that we look at. Now, um, Tolkien was a medievalist who taught for many years at Merton College, Oxford. Uh, he was considered to be a, just a really horrible lecturer. Uh, Adam Gopnik, in his article in The New Yorker um, in the past year, talks about some memories by famous writers like Kingsley Amos um, and Philip Larkin about just how insufferable Tolkien's lectures were. He'd often sort of, he would mumble, you couldn't hear him. Um, he'd stand at the board and write, just huge lists of Old Norse words or Anglo-Saxon words, and then kind of while he was talking, he'd erase them without anybody being able to see them, um, and that kind of thing. So um, he wasn't really good at, you know, sort of lecturing to an audience of students, um, but he certainly was um, a great student himself and also scholar of Old Norse and Anglo-Saxon. He even wrote poems in Anglo-Saxon. Um, he, and when, by Anglo-Saxon, let me remind you that what I mean is what we also call Old English, something that ends with the year 1100 approximately, and that's something that, you know, I constantly tell Britlet One people because I want you to spread this word to the rest of the English-speaking world, namely that Shakespeare is not Old English. Old English, I'll show you Old English. Old English looks like German, and it takes months of grammatical study to be able to read anything in Anglo-Saxon. Uh, but at any rate, um, Anglo-Saxon was one of the things that um, Tolkien was a scholar of. Um, Tolkien knew the Icelandic sagas, the mythological Eddas from Old Norse. He knew heroic poems such as Beowulf. Um, he also uh, was very familiar with the reconstructed medieval epic uh, from Finland called the Kalevala. Um, it actually wasn't put together in a sort of a written form until the 19th century. He was also familiar with Celtic heroic cycles, and this is something that interested him all through his life. So what I'd like to do is to talk a little bit about what Tolkien did with this knowledge in his creative work um, and how he worked with a tradition that he was very learned in and yet also transformed it in his own way. I want to talk about several specific examples from The Hobbit and then maybe some other examples. Then I want to talk about the meaning of what he was doing just a little bit. Um, so first of all, 
Middle Earth. That's a term that everybody's heard. And if you've taken my Bridlet One course, of course, we start English literature with Cadman's hymn. And Cadman uh, writes in Anglo-Saxon. He uh, is, is talking about creation, and he describes this world that we live in as Middle Earth, or that's what the um, Anglo-Saxon words translate as. Um, if you look at um, the um, the uh, the term uh, midanyard in Anglo-Saxon. This basically means middle enclosure or fenced-in place or yard. Um, and it's the place where human beings lived, um, between heaven and hell, if you like. Um, and, um, and then also, uh, there are similar forms in Myth Old Norse. It looks kind of like this. Um, myth... Garther, and this funny F here is just an TH sound. Still use an Icelandic, by the way. Um, so a similar word there. In uh, Middle English, it becomes midden aired, for instance. Um, in Anglo Saxon poetry, midden yard is used to describe where humans live. It appears in Cadman's hymn, it appears in the long religious poem Genesis A, for instance. Um, now, that's something about Middle Earth, about the places where, um, where humans live in the middle. If you look at the Old Norse mythological writings in the Eddas, and I'll be talking more about the Eddas this evening, um, but if you look in those writings, um, the Eddas feature up to nine different worlds, um, places for different beings to live in. And they're known as Heimer, or Homes. This is similar to our English word home. Um, for instance, Jutunheimer for the giants. Um, some of these Heimer are, are, uh, don't use the actual term Heimer in it, but guard. So, for instance, Midgard, meaning Middle Earth um, for human beings, or Midgarther in the original Norse. Midgard is a kind of an Anglicization that you find in um, Old Norse stories translated into English. And um, also Asgard for the Aesir, the Norse gods, kind of like a Mount Olympus. And there are some other places, too, like... Um, for instance, uh, Niflheim uh, for the giants, or um, Hel, uh, which is the word for the underworld, and that's where we get our, our uh, English word Hell as it happens. Now, um, this is a cosmology that you find in Old Norse writing. Um, and um, by the way, Midgard, this Middle Earth place, was supposedly created from bits and pieces of a giant named Emir. Um, and so, for instance, the Eddas tell us that uh, his bones were used for mountains, the trees um, were made out of his hair, his skull became the sky with the stars in it and stuff like that. And um, the specific area called Middle Earth, um, you know, was surrounded, um, you know, it sort of borders, if you like, were made from his eyelashes. Um, and, you know, Middle Earth suggests something like a fenced-in area, and this could be like a wicker fence uh, for what it's worth. So, anyway, those are some... Um, some worlds that kind of surround Middle Earth. Um, again, a term that Tolkien uses. And Tolkien uses parts of this cosmology, um, this uh, sort of picture of the universe, in The Lord of the Rings. Um, and by the way, in the Silmarillion, he actually has a pantheon of gods that's similar to the ones that you find in the writings of Snorri Sturluson. I'm going to talk about Snorri in a little bit as well. He was an old Norse writer in the 14th century, um, though with different names. Uh, Tolkien um, creates other names that are based on his artificial languages. Now, but one thing that he does say about the world that he's creating and about this Middle Earth, um, in a letter that he wrote to his, uh, at, at one point, is that mine is not an imaginary world, quote-unquote imaginary world, but it's an uh, imaginary historical moment on Middle Earth, which is our habitation. Okay, and so that's supposed to be the idea. You know, this is a lost other time, basically. And so this is part of what Tolkien um, kind of thought he was doing. He was imagining the missing mythology of certain parts of Europe, particularly England. England really doesn't have a mythology the way that Scandinavia does.
does, or Germany does. Uh, if anything, these uh, Scandinavian German stories were kind of imported into England. They appear in the digressions in Beowulf and stuff like that, but even Beowulf itself is not a poem about people in England. It's a poem about people in what is now northern Holland, southern Denmark, Sweden, um, and so forth. Um, and this is also what Tolkien believed that uh, was the role of philology. Now, philology is the learned study of, you know, comparative study of languages, which was the principal purpose of studying literature in the 19th century. And this um, kind of fell out of favor in the 20th century with the rise of literary criticism of the notion of the literary and of literature as something you could study as a definite subject. Um, and um, Tolkien didn't like to have this kind of divide between the study of language and the study of literature. It's kind of why I like him in some ways, because I'm constantly saying in my classes that literature is, after all, made of language, and you have to do business with language, with the grammar, the syntax, uh, the changing meanings of words, and so forth. And um, so anyway, more about philology later, but at any rate... Um, Creating Middle-earth, or, or creating um, an imaginary history of Middle-earth, was something that um, Tolkien was trying to do with his philological interests, with his interests in history, legend, saga, everything else, which he got from his um, readings in these original languages. Um, Another thing that Tom Shippey, who is a great scholar of uh, Tolkien, says is that um, if we think of Middle Earth as an intermediary place between heaven and hell or whatever, heaven and some kind of underworld, um, and again, the, there, when you read The Hobbit, there's no kind of sense of an afterlife or people going to hell or something like that. There's good and evil. Um, but The Hobbit, the character of The Hobbit um, itself is a kind of um, an intermediary between between a mythic age and our modern age. So that's something to think about. Uh, the hobbits are kind of in the middle as well. That gets me to talking about, um, you know, a couple of other examples uh, from The Hobbit. Of course, The Hobbit's in Middle-earth, so is Lord of the Rings, the uh, trilogy that follows it. Um, Tolkien's fantasy story set in Middle-earth is, of course, a story that children can love. Um, and it has a lovable creature called the Hobbit. Um, and the Hobbits are, are largely, though I would argue not entirely, uh, Tolkien's unique creation. Um, now, children can love the Hobbit, but so can adults. Um, and that's why people return to Tolkien's work over the years. And, of course, it tends to mean different things with different experiences. And we all know this from revisiting literature. You know, I the last time I read Anna Karenina was when I was in high school. And I would really like to go back to it and see, like, what I think about it, after all. All I can remember about Anna Karenina right at the moment, besides the, uh, you know, being with the peasants and and, um, and harvesting stuff, was uh, Anna Karenina. Anna in his final moment on the railroad track, which I would, uh, I can do a, a sort of an impression of that. Um, anyway, that's the end of the novel. Just a spoiler alert, I should give him a spoiler alert, but um, at any rate, um, you know, people, people come back to this novel um, again and again. It's a charming and um, entertaining tale with what seems to be a, an avuncular narrator, yet there's also a rich substructure. And that substructure is part of Tolkien's enormous learning, his philological learning in Old Norse and Anglo-Saxon and so forth. Um, as Adam Gopnik says in his article, The Dragon's Egg, Tolkien creates an arranged marriage between the Elder Edda, which is an old, old Norse um, mythological work, and The Wind in the Willows. Um, it's a big Icelandic romance and a small, cozy English children's book combined together. Um, the story told by the Lord of the Rings is essentially what would happen if Mole and Ratty got drafted into the Nibelungenlied, which is a, a Germanic epic of the Middle Ages. And J.K. Rowling intuitively followed this part of the formula by mixing a very old-fashioned kind of English public school story um, with uh, what Tolkien would call the sword and sorcery realm. 
um, and those two are, are meshed together. So I think that uh, Rowling is writing in that kind of tradition. Again, she's writing specifically for children, but of course, people who are a lot older read Rowling, and by now there's the, the novels have been around so long that people can go back to them from the time that they were children. In fact, when the first um, editions of uh, Henry, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, as it was called in Britain, came out, there actually were adult editions that you could buy, so it didn't look like an obviously children's book, so you wouldn't be so embarrassed. Um, and by the way, Rowling um, incorporates aspects of classical mythology in her work. That's part of her um, educational training. Um, so anyway, Gopnik calls this an arranged marriage between the Elder Edda and the Wind of the Willows. Um, to illustrate this arranged marriage, I want to give you an example from... Um, the Hobbit, um, and again, um, I, I'm just curious about something. How many of you have read The Hobbit? Raise your hands. Okay, yeah, this is it's, this is so obvious. It's kind of like it's the opposite of when I ask people in Humanities One, how many of you have heard of Boethius, and nobody has. Um, and of course, Boethius wrote about the vicissitudes of fame, um, among other things. But a lot of people are familiar with The Hobbit. So here's something that's familiar that I just want to read to you. I want to read um, a passage from the beginning, and this is slightly long, but I want uh, there's a reason why. I'm, I'm going to read this aloud and compare this to something from um, medieval sources. Um, so this is at, in the chapter called An Unexpected Party. Just before tea time, there came a tremendous ring on the front doorbell, and then he remembered. He rushed and put on the kettle, and he, of course, is Bilbo, um, and put out, um, put out another cup and saucer and an extra cake or two and ran to the door. I am so sorry to keep you waiting, he was going to say, when he saw that it was not Gandalf at all. It was a dwarf with a blue beard tucked into a golden belt, very bright eyes under his dark green hood. As soon as the door was opened, he pushed inside, just as if he had been expected. He hung his hooded cloak on the nearest peg, and, Dwalin at your service, he said with a low bow. Bilbo Baggins at yours, said the hobbit, too surprised to ask any questions for the moment. When the silence that followed had become uncomfortable, he added, I am just about to take tea. Pray come and have some with me. A little stiff, perhaps, but he meant it kindly. And what would you do if an uninvited dwarf came and hung his things up in your hall without a word of explanation? They had not been at table long. In fact, they had hardly reached the third cake when there came an, another even louder ring at the bell. Excuse me, said the hobbit, and off he went to the door. So you have got here at last. That was, the, was what he was going to say to Gandalf at this time. But it was not Gandalf. Instead, there was a very old-looking dwarf in the step with a white beard and a scarlet hood, and he, too, hopped inside as soon as the door was open, just as if he had been invited. Um, I see they have begun to arrive already, he said, when he caught sight of Dwalin's green hood hanging up. He hung his red one next to it, and Balin at your service, he said with his hand on his breast. Thank you, said Bilbo with a gasp. It was not the correct thing to say, but they have begun to arrive had flustered him badly. He liked visitors, but he liked to know them before they arrived, and he preferred to ask him the, them himself. He had a horrible thought that the cakes might run short, and then he, as the host, um, he knew his duty and stuck to how it, however, however painful, he might have to go without. Come along in and have some tea, he managed to say after taking a deep breath. When he got back, Balin and Dwalin were t talking at the table like old friends. As a matter of fact, they were brothers. Bilbo plumped down at the, the beer and the cake in front of them when loud came a ring at the bell again, and then another ring. Gandalf for certain this time, he thought, as he puffed along the passage. But it was not. It was two more dwarves, each of them, uh, both with blue hoods, silver belts, and yellow beards, and each of them carried a bag of tools and a spade. In they hopped, as soon as the door began to open. Bilbo was hardly surprised at all. What can I do for you, my dwarves? Keely at your service, said one, and Feely added the other, and they both swept off their blue hoods and bowed. And yours and your families, replied Bilbo, remembering his manners this time. Dwalin and Balin here already, I see, said Keely. Let us go join the throng. Throng, thought Mr. Bog Baggins. I don't like the sound of that. I really must sit down for a minute and collect my wits and have a drink. He had only had just a sip in the corner while the four dwarves sat around the table and talked about mines and gold and troubles with goblins and the depredations of dragons and lots of other things which he did not understand and did not want to, for they sounded much too adventurous. When ding dong a ling dang his bell rang again as if some naughty little hobbit boy was trying to pull the handle off. Someone at the door, he said, blinking. Some four, I should say, by the sound, said Feely. Besides, we saw them coming along behind us in the distance. The poor little hobbit sat down in the hall and put his head in his hands and wondered what had happened and what was going to happen and whether they would all stay to supper. 
Then the bell rang again, louder than ever, and he had to run to the door. It was not four, after all, it was five. Another dwarf had come along while he was wandering in the hall. He had hardly turned the knob before they were all inside, bowing and saying at your service, one after another. Dory, Nori, Ori, Oyen, and Gloin were their names. And very soon, two purple hoods, a gray hood, um, a brown hood, and a white hood were hanging on the pegs, and off they marched with their broad hands stuck in their gold and silver belts to join the others. Already it had almost become a throng. Some called for ale, and some for porter, and one for coffee, and all of them for cakes. So the hobbit was kept very busy for a while. Um, and there was Gandalf. Um, oh, I'm sorry, more dwarves, four more. This is I'm skipping a little bit. And there was Gandalf behind, leaning on his staff, laughing. So there were four more. He had made quite a dent on the beautiful door. He had also, by the way, knocked out the secret mark that he had put there the morning before. Carefully, carefully, he said, it is not like you, Bilbo, to keep friends waiting on the mat and then open the door like a pop gun. Let me introduce Biffer, Buffer, Bomber, and especially Thorin. At your service, said Biffer, Buffer, and Bomber, standing in a row. Then they hung up two yellow hoods and a pale green one, and also a sky blue one with long silver tassels. This last belonged to Thorin, an enormously important dwarf. In fact, no other than the great Thorin Oakenshield himself, who was not at all pleased at falling flat in Bilbo's mat with Biffer, Bomber, uh, Buffer, and Bomber on top of him. For one thing, Bomber was immensely fat and heavy. Thorin indeed was very haughty and said nothing about service, but poor Mr. Baggins said he was sorry so many times that at last he grunted, pray don't mention it, and stopped frowning. Now we are all here, said Gandalf, looking at the row of thirteen hoods, the best detachable party hoods, and his own hat hanging on the pegs. Quite a merry gathering. I hope that there is something left for the latecomers to eat and drink. Um, And so then, of course, um, you know, the... uh, uh, Bilbo says to himself, confusticate and be bothered these dwarves, he said aloud. Why don't they come and lend a hand? Um, lo and behold, there stood Balin and Dwalin at the door of the kitchen, and Feely and Keely behind him, and before he could say knife, they had whisked the trays and a couple of small tables into the parlor and set out everything fresh. So, anyway, this is the beginning of the story, really. I mean, well, you know, it's not the exact beginning, because Gandalf has been by already, um, and we've been introduced to the notion of hobbits. But we have this series of dwarves appearing bit by bit by bit. Okay. Now, the names of these dwarves are actually Old Norse, and they come from the Eddas. And here's the point where I'd like to pass out the handout. So, um, Chris, if you could do that, just pass some down the rows, please. Um, The original Edda, which is known as the Poetic or Elder Edda because it's written in Old Norse poetry, um, appears in the Codex Regius manuscript of the 13th century. And it may come from a text that's even older. It's just the latest manuscript we have is from the 13th century. Um, The Poetic Edda consists of Old Norse poems that recount a number of the major Old Norse mythological stories. And um, one of these stories uh, called the Voluspa um, is a conversation between the high god Ovid, um, excuse me, not Ovid, um, wrong empire, Odin, um, the the high god Odin, um, and uh, a wise woman whose name is, I kid you not, Volva, and um, thus we get Voluspa. Um, And um, and, and basically, she tells Odin about the origins of various worlds and the creations therein. And one of those divine creations is that of the dwarves. Now, this particular story from the Voluspa is, uh, the, the information in it, is reset in a prose collection, which is called the Prose Edda, because it's written in prose, by this guy named Snorri, Snorri Sturluson, um, in the 14th century, in 14th century Iceland. Um, and this basically sort of, again, it retells parts of the Elder Edda. Um, and, um, and to some extent, uh, according to Paul, battles makes a more well-ordered creation story. It uh, in- includes Christian influences since Snorri himself is a Christian and so forth. Um, but in the first part of Snorri's prose edda, which is called Gilfaginning, and you have two pages from that here from a translation of it, there's a Swedish king named Gilfi who is skilled in magic, and he wants to see if the gods in Asgard really have similar powers. He's heard about this. So he dresses as an old man, and he makes off for Asgard, where the, the gods um, live. Now, the gods, um, knowing that this clever Swedish king is coming in disguise, because after all, they're gods, they know this kind of stuff, they decide to have some fun with him for being so audacious. So when he gets there, when, uh, when um, this disguised Gilfi gets there, um, he sees not 
Odin and Thor and Freya on thrones, but a whole cavalcade of revelers uh, drinking and feasting and juggling and gambling in this big hall. And then at the end of the hall, he sees three kings on thrones stacked on top of each other, which is kind of odd. Um, the names of the three kings are High, just as high, and third, um, which I think is uh, hilarious. Um, and these figures answer Gilfi's questions about the origin of the world, just as Odin asked Volva, and they actually quote the Volva Spa. So what, part of what uh, the story is doing is he's, he's saying there is this earlier tradition, and now we're going to refer to parts of it. Um, so uh, if you just look at this text here um, on page um, 16, um, the, um, the, the gods took their places on the, their thrones and instituted their courts and discussed where the dwarves had been generated from the soil and down in the earth like maggots and flesh. The dwarves had taken shape first and acquired life in the flesh of Ymir, and we were then maggots. But by decision of the gods, they became conscious with intelligence and had the shape of men, though they live in the earth and in the rocks. Modsognir was a dwarf, and the second was Durin. Thus it says in Volaspa, uh, they went all the powers to their judgment seats, most holy gods, and deliberated upon this, that a troop of dwarfs should be created from bloody surf and from blind's bones. Their man forms many were made, dwarfs in the earth, as Durin said. And the names of these dwarfs, says the prophetess, that's Volva, are these. Nyi, Nidi, Nordri, Sudri, Austri, Vestri, Athiolf, Dvalin, Nar, Nain, Nipping, Dain, Biffer, Buffer, Bomber, Nori, Ori, Onar, Oin, Modvitner, Vig, and Gandalf, Vindalf, Thorin, Fili, Keeli, Fundin, Vali, Thor, Throwin, Thek, Lit, Vitter, Nir, Nirad, Rek, and Radsvin. But these are also, there are also dwarves that live in rocks, whereas the previous ones lived in soil. And so there's Dropner, Dolg, Fari, Hor, Hookstari, Fledioth, Glowin, Dori, Ori, Doof, Andvari, Heptifili, Har, and Siar. And um, so anyway, th- those are some lists of dwarf names. Look familiar? Um, well, um, in, you know, this is the kind of stuff that uh, Tolkien used to read all of the time. Now, um, it's interesting, by the way, that Gandalf is originally in a list of dwarfs here. <laughs> um, so um, he is not a dwarf in Tolkien, but there's his name right there. Now, what you have here, this list, it's called a catalog. That's, um, you know, a kind of a convention in ancient literature, and it comes from oral sources, where part of the purpose of literature was not necessarily to be creative or self-expressive or something like that, um, but to record memory, to the memories of important names and actions of um, the lore of a people. And this in, and included in this are the, these mythological names. Um, so often these catalogs, um, when you see them in, like, in epic poetry or, or something like that, or romance, they're connected with action. Though here they seem to be mostly an inventory of the gods' creations, of the gods' actions. It's not these dwarves doing things themselves, but here are the names. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you notice how genealogies and lists of names are important in other kinds of ancient literature. Look at the genealogies in the Torah and the Gospels, for instance, as just one example. Um, now, what Tolkien does is to take this catalog and use parts of it to establish the members of the company in The Hobbit, um, along with you know setting up the fraught relationship between Bilbo and the dwarves, and indeed between Bilbo and versions of himself, ultimately. Um, so this catalog becomes something different. Um, you notice the names are similar to each other. Uh, they have some kind of close relationship, and you can see that Feeling and Keely are right next to each other, for instance, and they happen to be brothers in Tolkien. Now, Tolkien takes this catalog again and does something sort of similar with it when the dwarves arrive later at the house of Bjorn, the shapeshifter, and you may recall this. He's a gruff, suspicious, but basically good-hearted shapeshifter. He can turn into a bear-like creature um, who hates goblins. And he also um, is kind of a semi-loner. He doesn't like to have large groups of people in his compound. And But, you know, 
the, the dwarves and Gandalf and the Hobbit need a place to stay. And so what Gandalf does is arrive first at Bjorn's with the Hobbit. And he begins to tell Bjorn a story about fighting and destroying goblins, which grabs Bjorn's attention. Um, you know, you can always do this with gruff, powerful people. It's the same thing like the Thousand and One Nights and so forth. You can keep the king from killing you at the end of the wedding night by, you know, stopping the story at a certain point. That's the power of narrative. Um, and um, as Gandalf does this, he keeps adding bit by bit the names of a few of the dwarves who were involved in this anti-goblin story and who suddenly arrive in pairs, mostly, and whom Baron grudgingly accepts because he's mostly concentrated on Gandalf's heroic tale and he wants to see how it turns out. Um, the catalog here is also a revisiting of this um, you know, uh, arrival of uh, the dwarves earlier. Um, and um, you know, again, using these names, that were originally in Edda. Um, and it's similar in a sense because you already have Bilbo in place. He was in place in his hobbit hole. Here he is in place in Bjorn's house, even though this is not uh, Bilbo's house. Um, and then you have the arrival of the dwarves. And you know, and actually to say it's not Bilbo's house is important. If you compare this catalog with the earlier catalog, something has changed in the narrative. This is Bjorn's house, um, and uh, the hobbit has already encountered more than any hobbit has encountered in his life. Life practically, except for some of the um, the legendary ones in his family on the Took side. Um, you know, um, Bilbo at this point has already encountered dwarf eating tro- trolls, wargs, vicious arsonist goblins, and rescue eagles. Plus, he's engaged in a riddle contest with Gollum in the dark. Um, not to mention the fact that Bilbo has found a ring of power quite by accident. So, all that stuff has happened. Um, he is a different person. He may still like his creature comforts, and he appreciates what he can get at Bjorn's house the cream and the honey, and at least something soft to sleep on. He gets a very simple dollop of creature comforts. But this scene now, with its catalog of unexpected dwarfs, does mark just how far Bilbo, and in fact the whole company has come in their personal connections to each other in the common facing of dangers, and in their sheer endurance and survival. And it's interesting to me as well that there's a kind of valedictory catalog positioned at the end of the work, um, and uh, this is when, you know, uh, after the battle and some, uh, you know, Thorns died, and uh, Bil- Bilbo is taking his leave. Um, and saying, Farewell, Balin, and farewell, Dwalin, and farewell, Dory, Nori, Ori, Oin, Bloin, Biffer, Boffer, and Bomber. May your beards never grow thin. And turning towards the mountain, he added, Farewell, Thor, and Oaken Shield, and Feely and Keely. May your memory never fade. Now, this is just one example of the use of an, um, some Old Norse material in uh, Tolkien's text, and how Tolkien... Um, you know, repurposes it, um, I think, very effectively uh, and seamlessly for his own uh, narrative. Another example is of the dragon fight. And um, we know that Bilbo encounters Smog, the dragon who sits on top of a hoard of treasure that once belonged to the dwarves. It's Smog who goes down and destroys the town in the Long Lake, and he's ultimately shot down by uh, Bard. Um, now, um, this is partly, partly something that you find in Beowulf. Um, there's a story in Beowulf of, um, and I'm just going to read a few lines here, of um, basically uh, um, somebody stealing a cup and a dragon knowing about it. So um, let me just read a few words to hear. Um, Beowulf by now is 50 years old, and uh, on, on dark nights during his time, during Beowulf's old age, a dragon began to terrify the Geats, Beowulf's people. He lived on a cliff, kept watch over a hoard in a high stone barrow. Below there was a secret path. A man strayed into this barrow by chance, seized some of the pagan treasures, stole drinking vessels. At first the sleeping dragon was deceived by the thief's skill, but afterwards he avenged this theft of gleaming gold. People far and wide, bands of retainers, became aware of his wrath. Um, That man did not intrude upon the hoard deliberately, he who robbed the dragon, but it was some slave, a wanderer in distress, escaping from men's anger who entered there seeking refuge. He stood guilty of some sin. As soon as he peered in, the outsider stiffened with horror. Unhappy as he was, he stole the vessel, the precious cup. 
There were countless heirlooms in that earth cave, the enormous legacy of a noble people, ancient treasures which some man or other had cautiously concealed there many years before. And of course the dragon discovers this, um, he's been sitting on the treasure for 300 years, and he goes out and starts breathing fire and destroying things, and destroying um, Beowulf's people, and that's why Beowulf has to um, spring into action. Now, in The Hobbit, of course, it's Bilbo who becomes the thief, but this is part of a self-fulfilling prophecy that we've seen throughout the novel. You know, uh, Bilbo is described as the burglar, and he's like, what do you mean I'm a burglar? You know, that doesn't make any sense. But he slowly grows into this role in a number of ways. You know, hobbits can walk very, very quietly, for instance. Um, And... um, you know, his high, quiet machinations, hiding the ring from Gollum, secretly rescuing the dwarves by stealing keys and um, hiding them in barrels in the hall, halls of the Elven King, and eventually strategically stealing the Arkenstone, which Thorin wants so much. Um, or wants back. Um, so Bilbo is growing into a characterization that he did not want, and that becomes even more than any of the other characters had really counted on. And here he is... Um, being the one who steals something from the dragon, um, kind of like stealing something from the dragon that uh, arouses his ire um, in Beowulf. Now, it's Beowulf who fights the dragon in Beowulf, and he wants the treasure for his people. Uh, Beowulf fights nearly alone, and while he's granted a view of the treasure before he dies, the treasure becomes useless for all. It's buried with Beowulf in his mound, and more ominously, a power vacuum is left behind, and there are forecasts of doom for his people, so it's very tragic at the end of Beowulf. In The Hobbit, it's the figure of Bard who kills the dragon. He he eventually succeeds the master as the head of the League people. And Bard, of course, does not die. Instead, it's the leader of the dwarves, Thorin Oakenshield, who desired treasure too much in the end. And in a rather Anglo-Saxon turn, um, Thorin is defended to the last by his two sister sons. He sometimes calls them the, the these are the sons of my of my father's daughter or something like that in this imperious way that he gets to talking. But it's um, this is a very common motif in um, Anglo-Saxon uh, heroic poetry. The relationship between a man and his sister's son is considered a very deep, moving, intimate family relation. And that's who Feely and Keeley are. Um, so at any rate, that's, that's something that, um, again, that that um, Tolkien is using from Beowulf, but transforming for his own purposes. Now, that's the Beowulf part. That's the Anglo-Saxon part. Um, Beowulf alludes to some of the lore that you find in more detail in, um, in Norse mythology, as in the Eddas, for instance, or in the... Um, the story of the Volsungs um, that reappears in places like the Nibelungenlied. This is all in a number of different texts in the Middle Ages, in Old Norse, and in German, and so forth. And the character of Smog um, is something that um, Tolkien creates, but it's based partly on these um, these um, uh, Anglo-Saxon and also Old Norse um, origin. Now, first of all, um, Smog's name, and this is something that Tom Shippey points out, and this is where um, Tolkien gets his philology on. Um, the name Smog, um, and let's see, I need to erase something here. Um, so the name Smog, um, which sounds to us maybe kind of like smug or something like that, or smog. Um, but it comes from a proto-Germanic verb, meaning that we don't know if this verb ever existed. We don't uh, exactly. We don't have written um, data for it. We don't have um, you know written um, records for it. But linguists reconstruct what original forms might have been. This is how they figure out what Indo-European roots might have been based on comparative linguistics. So this comes from a proto-Germanic verb that probably looked like this. It was smugon, and the past tense was smog, or smog. Um, And this means to squeeze through a hole. Um, And if you think about it, that's kind of what um, the dragon does. The dragon is described as a worm. That's a word that's used in Germanic, and it's also kind of an an archaic, uh, even early modern um, English word to mean a dragon or a serpent. Um, Yet, um, and and in Old English, you see um, there's a phrase in um, one particular text that looks like this. With 
smeogon, wurma, which means against the impenetrable worm or dragon. Um, but also smeagon, or actually it should be pronounced smeagon, in, smeagon in Old English can mean to inquire into, and it can be used as an adjective to mean subtle or crafty. All of these are philological formulas which Tolkien uses to invest certain characteristics into smog. And you can see that all of these things are kind of um, in this character. Now, um, what, um, what, uh, 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 excuse me, what um, Tolkien is doing partly is drawing from a story in uh, the Voluspa about the Volsungs. Um, there's a dragon story uh, that starts out with a dwarf named Anfari, you saw his name in the list, um, who creates a golden ring, which is then stolen by the gods Loki, Odin and Honer to pay damages for killing the son of a dragon. I'm um, sorry, excuse me, the son of a giant. What am I saying? The son of a giant. Um, and this son is named Otter. Um, and of course, he can sometimes take that form. Um, because of the theft, Anvari curses the ring. Uh, he sets a curse on it. The ring eventually passes on to a mortal family, the Volsungs, when um, Sigurd Volsung kills the brother of Otter, a guy named Fafnir, who can change his shape into the shape of a dragon. Um, and so the curse continues. Now, Tom Shippey has this to say about how um, Bilbo's encounter with Smog uses aspects of this legend and yet changes them. So Bilbo's conversation with Smog is indeed a brilliant stroke. Like so much in the book, it has a model in an epic poem, the Fafnis Mall, in which Sigurd and Fafnir talk while the dragon dies of the wound the hero has given him. Like Bilbo, Sigurd um, tells the dragon his name, um, sorry, refuses to tell the dragon his name, he won't tell him that his name is Sigurd, but replies riddlingly for fear of being cursed. And this is what Bilbo does. Like Smog, Fafner sows dissension between partners by remarking on the greed that gold excites. The dissension actually breaks out when eating the dragon's heart um, helps Sigurd to understand bird talk. This is, by the way, this is how you can understand birds. Eat a dragon's heart. It will help. Um, and, you know, understanding bird talk is another prominent hobbit motif with, the, you know, trying to understand the thrush and understand the raven who actually talks in common speech. Nevertheless, the Fafnis mob once again did not offer Tolkien enough. It drifted off into mere exchange of in information, and there was not enough of the real worm with a bestial life and thought of his own, as Tolkien put it. So uh, Tolkien therefore set himself to repair this gap, and did so once more by introducing a strong dose of anachronistic modernity. Now, Shippey goes on, thus the most remarkable thing that Smog, uh, about Smog is his oddly circumlocutory mode of speech. He speaks, in fact, with the characteristic aggressive politeness of the British upper class, in which irritation and authority are in direct proportion to apparent deference or uncertainty. You have nice manners for a thief and a liar, are his opening words to Bilbo, their degree of irony unclear. You seem familiar with my name, but I don't seem to remember smelling you before. Who are you and where do you come from, may I ask? He might be a testy colonel approached by a stranger in a railway carriage. Why has Bilbo not been introduced? At the same time, the bestial life of the work keeps intruding as he remarks on Bilbo's smell and boasts parenthetically, I know the smell and taste of dwarf, none better. Or when he rolls, rolls over absurdly pleased like a clumsy spaniel to show the hobbit his armored belly. Um, now, there are, there are a number of other, um, you know, this is just one other example, and um, you know, I, I think we're, we don't really have enough time. I could spend some time talking about a number of miscellaneous things that scholars have noted um, in, um, you know, uh, looking at how Tolkien is using his sources. They're all over the place. For Just one, for instance. Um, in the sagas, there tend to be a lot of stock characters who keep reappearing. And two so stock character types from the sagas um, actually appear in Bilbo. One is known as the Ethnilegger Mother, or the Promising Young Man. Um, and um, then the other one is called the Coal Beater, or the Coal Biter, or Male Cinderella, somebody who is down there with the soot and the coal and so forth. Um, 
it's interesting that Tolkien created a group um, at Oxford called the Coal Biters to discuss Old Norse texts of the, st- the sagas, and they'd read in the original and they'd discuss them. And this is the group that preceded the famous Inklings. Um, so, at any rate, that's um, you know those are just a, a, a number of examples. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, or reflect just a little bit, uh, finally, about what Tolkien is doing. I mean, what the meaning of all of this is. Um, Tom Shippey would say that Tolkien is following the directives of what he understood as philology, and I've explained a little bit of that before. Um, in the early decades of the 20th century, in places like Oxford, um, the notion of studying texts in a literary way was becoming a very distinct thing from studying texts from a linguistic approach, which had been dominant, particularly for medieval texts um, in the, the 19th century and the early 20th century. In 1930, in the essay The Oxford English School, Tolkien conceived of both of these approaches, the literary and the linguistic, or what he called lit and lang, as too narrow in themselves. The third dimension, Shippey says, was philological. It was angles to both. Um, And it was from this that he trained himself to see things, and from this too that he wrote his works of fiction. And Shippey says, uh, philology is indeed the only proper guide to a view of Middle Earth, of the sort of which the author might have been supposed to have desired. Um, For Tolkien, um, philology encompassed a careful, learned, comparative study of languages, Um, but it was also meant um, to create inquiries um, into lost histories and lost anthologies. I'm sorry, lost mythologies. Here's an example of what meant by that um, in um, when uh, Tolkien wrote to his son Christopher about two words, Akta and Attila. Now you'll recognize that second word. That's a name. Um, name of Attila the Hun. Um, and Tolkien said, without those syllables, the whole great drama behind history and legend loses savor for me. Now, um, what does he mean by that? The point is that um, Attila, um, who, though, uh, though a Hun, um, was an enemy of the Goths, um, and um, and, and um, actually he he was a Hun. He was an enemy of the Goths, and yet he doesn't seem to have a barbarian name. Attila is actually a kind of a, a, a nickname or a diminutive form of the Gothic word for father, um, and the Gothic word is Atta. Attila means little father or even dad. You know, can you imagine calling Attila the Hun dad, dad the Hun? Um, and it's just, what that suggests to Tolkien is um, that there were many Goths in uh, Attila's armies. Um, and, you know, that's sort of interesting because the Goths wouldn't have been a part of the Central Asian horde coming in or whatever. Um, so that's something that um, philology suggests to Tolkien. You can look at these things and you can sort of get clues about lost histories or or lost mythologies, lost the, a lost imaginary, if you like. Um, Tolkien went on to say in his letter that in his mind, um, this was exactly how the Lord of the Rings grew and worked. He had not constructed a design, and instead he tried to create a situation in which a common greeting would be, Elen si la lumen omen tiamo. And, you know, in, in Elvish. Um, and so he was sort of building um, a narrative around the language, which was uh, kind of interesting in itself. Um, so Tolkien um, was doing something different from what some other fantasy writers do who do not rely heavily or at all on a learned or far-flung tradition. Um, he's bringing a learned tradition, the culmination of a vast amount of scholarship and expertise and study, on a creative work by providing a very ancient lineage as a kind of infrastructure or foundation for his own writings. It's kind of like the code language or assembly language that's underneath the GUI, the interface, um, if you like. Um, and this is a way in which Tolkien's fiction, for all its accessibility to children or to modern readers, is also a logical outgrowth of medieval tradition. Um, other writers, like my classmate, um, how long ago was 1980? Oh my god, it was uh, 32 years ago, um, might try oh so hard not to do this. Um, and it's not that that's bad. 
or that Tolkien is better or more greatly to be valued as a literary artist simply for having uh, connected to this tradition. But it does keep present, I think, a huge and nearly forgotten treasure trove, if you like, of a past that has formed our language and our thinking in so many subtle and perhaps devious ways that we can barely imagine it. But if we not only imagine the past, but study it, it readjusts our sense of our own culture, perhaps, our, as um, you know, what we might think of it as a unique, free, untrammeled, or utterly deta- uh, uh, you know, detached from the past kind of culture, um, and instead realize that it is composed of language, language that has a history. Now, um, Adam Gopnik refers to a, um, a fantasy writer um, who doesn't quite do this. Um, and, you know, he doesn't really study the medieval sources as um, as um, closely, um, but who follows Tolkien, and that's um, the, uh, Chris Paolini, uh, the author of the Aragon series. You know, a teenage boy who rides a dragon, and. Um, Gothic says that what Paolini does is a typical instance of the Tolkien-derived idea of the children's book conceit turned into an epic one. That's what um, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings are doing. Um, and while Gothic sees Paolini as you know, using a tradition, it's using Tolkien primarily. Um, you know, uh, like Paolini was this wunderkind who published his first work. I think he was like 16 or something like that. Some of you might know, but um, some of you might have read this. Um, and in a way, then, uh, Paolini's use of tradition is kind of second order. Um, he didn't read the Eddas in detail in Old Norse. He read Tolkien's, you know, um, refractions of them in Tolkien's work. Now, Gothic does see a strength in the Aragon series in the way that it, it tr- attracts specifically teenage readers, especially teenage boys who see their current lives as one more ordeal after another that they have to go through. Um, at any rate, um, you know, I, I I'm interested in Tolkien partly because he can um, connect us um, to this very ancient tradition, even in a modern creation. And, um, you know, his whole scholarly career, then, I think, needs to be taken into consideration, that intertextuality, in order to give The Lord of the Rings its fair dues. I want to end with um, something. When I, when I was thinking about um, this, uh, what I would say in this lecture, um, I started thinking about um, T.S. Uh, T. Eliot's famous essay, Tradition and the Individual Talent, which I hadn't read in years. And so I thought I would go back and look at it, and it seemed a lot more imperious and formalist and solipsistic and kind of uh, almost hieratic in the kinds of um, abstract, airy statements he makes about criticism. But there's something that he says that strikes me that in a way I think Tolkien is doing. And so I want to end with uh, this note from Eliot. No poet, no artist of any art, has his complete meaning alone. His significance, his appreciation, and of course he's saying he, 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 so, you know, sort of understand that, you know, that's, this is Eliot uh, from the early 20th century. His significance, his appreciation, is the appreciation of his relation to the dead poets and artists. You cannot value him alone. You must set him for contrast and comparison among the dead. I mean this as a principle of aesthetic, not merely historical criticism. The necessity that he shall conform, that he shall cohere, is not one-sided. What happens when a new work of art is created is something that happens simultaneously to all the works of art which preceded it. The existing monuments form an ideal order among themselves, which is modified by the introduction of the new, the really new, work of art among them. The existing order is complete before the new work arrives. For order to persist after the supervention of novelty, the whole existing order must be, if ever so slightly altered. And so the relations, proportions, values of each work of art toward the whole are readjusted. And this is conformity between the old and the new. Whoever has approved this idea of order, of the form of European, of English literature, will not find it preposterous that the past should be altered by the present as much as the present is directed by the past. And the poet who is aware of this will be aware of great difficulties and responsibilities. Thank you. Uh, So, are there any questions? Yes, sir. Well, when you say that you would make the claim that uh, the like the entire Middle Earth universe and the one of the series was made as pretty much just a house for all the different languages he had created, 
Well, I, mean, I would say that that's partially true. Um, that you know, uh, Tolkien himself in that letter saying, "This is how I I began to conceive of this." Um, at the same time, it's not just a house for it. You know, it's not just that. Um, I think that I, I'm, part of what I would respond is there's truth in that, but it's not either or. It's both and. Um, and um, you know, Tolkien does create a narrative, and you can see by the just the way he creates his narrator um, and the the voice of the narrator. I think that he's having a lot of fun with it. He's also having fun with certain words that he chooses. Um, I'm thinking of the word. Um, you know, I, I was reading in Shippey's book about the particular choice of the word bewilderment to describe Thorin's re- reaction to the treasure hoard that they've rediscovered um, in inside the mountain, and. Um, I, that word bewildered has a sense of being confused and amazed and dazed, but it also um, has another meaning, which um, Tolkien would have been aware of, uh, an older meaning of the kind of sort of tangled and uh, multifaceted um, effect that a treasure might give off. Um, and so, you know, Tolkien was actually choosing those words carefully because he knew the, um, you know, the, the history of those words. Um, and those mattered to him, and he wanted those to he wanted to breathe life into them in some ways. Um, and so then that's going back to well, it's really that language, isn't it? But I think it's just it's a bouncing back and forth. And remember that philology for him was not lang or lit. Okay, it was a combination. Um, it was trying to bring those things together in some way. So. Yes. This might be like a naive question because I don't know much about this, but where would you draw the line between intertextuality and plagiarism? Oh well, um, in, in the Middle Ages, for instance, that's not an issue. <laughs> so, I know, you know. Not missing, but for Tolkien, he was writing in a time, so it's like him. Right. Well, I think it would be plagiarism if he just, if all he did. Um, was, you know, just sort of say, oh, um, here are some stories about some, uh, you know, a dragon whose heart was um, was eaten and stuff and somebody could hear birds, and it turns out that he just lifted that from um, the Volo Spa. Well, of course he doesn't do that. You know, if he did something like that and passed it off as his, as, as his own work, um, or didn't even say that this is a retelling of the Eddas, then that would be a problem. I don't know why anybody would do that, particularly. Um, and of course, I think I think you can see from these examples that he's hardly doing that. Um, you know, there's a big difference between that catalog from the Edda and the way that he turns that catalog into um, a very comical event that has an important, um, you know, structural function because it's going to be um, it's going to be mirrored in different ways later in the novel. So, um, so where I would draw the line between plagiarism and and, um, and, and I guess uh, creativity or something like that um, is, um, you know, quite obviously if you're just not taking the time to, to um, you know, create something uh, that's new um, and that's different um, and you're passing it off as your own stuff. Tolkien didn't do that. But what he was doing was to work with the tradition. And, look, um, a lot of literature does that exact same thing. I mean, you know, Shakespeare read Holinshed's Chronicles and read translations of Ovid and adapted um, stories and maybe pieces, maybe phrases. Um, Is that plagiarism? I think in in a creative um, context, um, probably not. Um, If it were in a scholarly context um, where you're actually writing scholarship, yeah, that would be. And, um, and see, he knew the difference. I mean, he also produced essays on Old Norse and Old English. He wrote introductions to important Middle English um, texts. He also was um, very famously the editor of um, a standard um, edition of Sir Gawain and Green Knight. I used it when I was in uh, grad school, and it wasn't that long ago from grad school. So, Yes? Um, is there any reason that he chose the particular names for the dwarves that he did among that list over the other names? Um... That I'm not sure. I'm not sure the reason for that. I know that he got them there. He wouldn't have wanted Anvari because Anvari is connected with, um, you know, the curse on the ring and so forth. So he wouldn't want to have somebody in that group there unless he wanted to have like a Judas-like figure, perhaps, in um, among the the dwarves. And there is betrayal to the dwarves, but it's by the Hobbit and it's for their own good, uh, and uh, because they're being stupid, um, and um, and um, Bilbo knows it. 
but um, you know, I don't know the reason particularly why he he, came, he chose them. It might have come come down to oh, I like the sound of those particular names. Um, he was always, in a way, romantically enchanted by the uh, myth lore and the languages of Northern Europe. Um, this is not a guy who was interested in Catalan or something like that, or the Mediterranean world. He was interested in Northern gloomy stuff. Um, and also interested in it because um, he lived in England, and um, he had a keen interest in the literature and history and archaeology of the place where he lived. So, Yes? Um, this isn't quite as deep, but I know um, Tolkien had a brush with a tarantula when he was younger, but do you know any, like, um, I didn't know mythological, <laughs> like, or, or any, any, like, sources that he drew upon for his tendency to have, like, giant spiders? Well, that might explain Shelob, you know. Okay. Um, I don't know of any mythological sources for the, the spiders offhand. Um, I couldn't tell you that. Um, and I can't think of, you know, when I've read the edit before and taught it, I don't remember spiders particularly. Um, that doesn't mean that there isn't some other text where they exist. But it could also be from this working out of childhood trauma. You know, you're a little guy with a little sword and you manage to kill the big spider. So, um, Kyle. Um, where did Tolkien get his basis for the ultimate from? Well... There are a couple of things, uh, some, somewhat out of his own ideas, but also from his interest in Old Norse and also his interest in, interest in Finnish. Uh, there's something agglutinative about uh, the, the elfin language, and while he's making different words, he's, he's creating um, certain kinds of grammatical structures that are similar to Finnish, for instance. Um, Finnish, um, if, if, um, I don't know how many of you have, were forced, forced, forcibly given Finnish lessons in college, in high school, but in case you weren't, um, Finnish ha- has something like 18 cases for its nouns, um, and so um, and really what it is is you're essentially creating prepositions at the ends of words, and they sometimes change the uh, nearby consonants and the vowel patterns and so forth. Um, and it's, um, that's something that Finnish does. Also, Turkish is an, is an agglutinative language. It adds these, um, these um, I guess, syntax bits, like prepositions, case, plurals, um, things like that, all to the end of a word. Um, and you can create quite a complicated phrase with just one word by adding these um, grammatical um, units, I guess. So he was getting that partly, he was getting the grammar partly from um, things like Finnish. Um, but he, in making up words, he didn't just make up words, he was thinking about how they connected with each other and how the phonology, the sound system, was um, organized together. So you would have thought of that as something coherent, rather than just, oh, I'll just make up words. Anything else? Well, thank you all for coming out. I really appreciate it.